Welcome everybody to Pitch Eye Chronicles Podcast. I'm Tats. I'm here with Donald. And uh, it has been the uh, the GM meetings have come to a conclusion. And one of the things that is being speculated or um, is being guessed on is what's going to happen before the CBA, CBA negotiations begin December 2nd. And a majority of fans and beat writers and players are expecting an influx of trade proposals over free agency signing before negotiations begin. And free agency really starting to take a hold after the new contract comes into place. Uh, Donald, do you think that makes sense for baseball to get the – for – Baseball executives to get the ball rolling with trades to kind of get a jump start before the negotiations begin. Well, remember, it makes a lot of sense because um, the the expected defend the expected lockout date is December first. Um, yeah. So no one really knows the the immediate future of the game after December first or when the lockout's going to end. You know, so that's why business is starting to rumble a lot faster than expected as we obviously mentioned last podcast we were seeing a lot more rumors than you would normally expect a couple of days after the world series or a week yeah. after the world series oh, we expect we're already be... seeing yeah, yeah we were, we're already seeing dead silence yeah so we're already seeing a lot of um high-ranking um beat writers who uh who are, who are talking about how advanced a lot of these negotiations are going and the, and the speed in which they are going at yeah. the moment. So uh, the reason for that is because um, no one knows the climate of baseball after December 1st. It could be that the lockout goes a couple months, maybe a couple weeks, we don't know, but it makes a lot of sense in order to get the major business done um, prior to December 1st um, because um, you know, you don't want to be in the situation where, say, the lockout ends um, a couple of weeks before pitchers and catchers report. You know what I mean? In, in, in which case, it would cause a lot of chaos, a lot of moving and, and things like that. So they might want to get started early. Um, I think that's what was probably the, the situation at the moment, especially yeah. with the well, Yankees, because they've got yeah. a lot of work to do. They've got a whole they've got a whole roster to make up, really. Let's, let's oh, yeah. Well, that's what it is. You hear, you know, we've already talked about it. Are they going to trade for a, a shortstop? Are they going to trade for a first baseman? Are they going to trade for a center fielder? But are they going to trade for sign a are, they, are they going to trade for bullpen? Are they going to trade for pitching? They're also now you're starting to see is Sanchez going to be on the move? Is he going to be somebody that he, the Yankees are looking to trade? And let's be realistic. What are you going to get for him? You know, we, we know what he could do with his bat. We know what he can do behind a plate. You know, we know what he does with the running game. You know, so there are positives to his game, but the negatives outweigh the positives. So I think the Yankees are going to have a very – then, I, not the Yankees. I think the fans really need to be prepared. You're really not going to – you know, you're not going to get anything for him. Don't expect – you're, you're not going to get a, a major league ready player for Sanchez. It's not going to happen. And the only way that you could justify moving Sanchez right now is if you're going to trade for another catcher. And, you know, one of the teams that we discussed uh, on our previous show was trades with Oakland. Can Sean Murphy be involved with those trades if the prospects match up right for Oakland? And does Oakland take on Sanchez or does Sanchez end up somewhere that we haven't even thought of yet? I don't see Oakland taking on Sanchez because he's due a um, arbitration, you know, he's probably due an increase in salary. Certainly not worth what he's been providing. Um, and Oakland want to shed money. They don't want to be adding money. So I, I don't know about Oakland. I don't think that Sanchez would be in any Oakland trades. Um, I think there's a, a limited market for, for Sanchez because, you know, teams will like the offensive potential that he provides. Um, but the Yankees need to move on from Gary Sanchez. I'll I'll be cl- be clear about that. Um, they they need to move on from him. I, I don't think that he is great 
in terms of what you're looking for in a catcher. I think we, we you know, we've got a lot of power as it is. We don't, you know, we don't need to keep saying, oh, what about Gary Sanchez's power? We don't need to replicate his power. You know, if we bring in a Matt Olsen um, or a Seager and stuff like that, we don't necessarily need a Gary Sanchez to be to be driving in 25 home runs or whatever. We yeah. need somebody who's a great defensive catcher. That's what we need. We need uh, somebody who our pitchers want to want to throw to. Gary Cole doesn't want to throw to Gary Sanchez. That's a big thing. No, it wasn't just him. I, I wanted... didn't really like throwing to Gary Sanchez. There was a bunch of guys that didn't really like throwing to Gary Sanchez. And there's a reason for that. He's just not a very good catcher. Yep. And one thing is a, a name that was that that was sent to me in a message from one of our uh, good friends of the show and off the show, um, Sarah, brought up uh, Wilson Contreras as an option for the Yankees. Do you think that he would be a good fit? And would, you know, the, the top line, you know, would Cole be comfortable with pitching to Contreras as well? Because that's the other factor. Cole's, I think Cole's going to have a big say of who's sitting behind that plate in, in the catching world. It would make sense. But, I mean, obviously, he's got a close relationship with Higashioka. I mean, I can't speak for Garrett Cole. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's strange that we even have to ask that question. Will Garrett Cole want to pitch to uh, – a catcher. I mean, I don't know of any other organizations that have that scenario. Do you know what I mean? It is very strange, well, but I think it's the, probably the personal for catcher Gary Sanchez. Is not, yeah, the personal catcher is not something that's new to baseball. No, that's not it's unique. Been, it's but, been highlighted because of the whole situation with Colin Sanchez yeah. in the New York in the New York headlines. Not, Cole just doesn't know. like Sanchez. He doesn't like no. going to him. It's as simple as that. Um, and let's also take it to account also, with Oakland. If they stay in Oakland, that's the worst place for Sanchez to go. Because look at the alf- the the foul re- the foul territory in Oakland. It's huge. Hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're thinking about the Yankee locker room and the and the trouble that there was in the in the locker room last year, yeah. I don't think Sanchez was a big help there because his attitude is. It's not a bad attitude. It's just a little, well, I would say lazy. I think he's got a lazy attitude, frankly. And I, and I don't know if that necessarily is something that you want to continue to have. I mean, he's been very coddled for a very long time by the organization. And I don't think it's lost among a lot of veterans uh, in that locker room. You know what I mean? He needs special attention. He needs special care and all this stuff. And frankly, I think it's getting exhausting at this point. I mean, I, I basically was done with Gary Sanchez after that play where uh, he had 15 feet to tag the Met player and he just didn't. I mean, that's an embarrassment. It's one of the worst plays yeah. I've ever seen in baseball. And it speaks to somebody who's not locked in. That's not somebody that you really want in a pennant race, man. He's just not all the way locked in all the time. And the thing is, he didn't actually have a terrible year last year, although the defensive metrics were terrible. He was actually an improvement from the year before. So I'm going to give him that, but I just don't think this is somebody that you really want in the locker room. No, I think, I think the guy yeah, who's just going to just, has got a little bit more of a fighter attitude in there. You want somebody who's just ready to go. So I think Contreras would be a fine fit. Uh, Murphy, I think they're all fine fits. I think you just need to move on from uh, Gary Sanchez. Yeah. I think it's also something we need to get Rob involved in um, one as, you know, as a, a Sanchez fan and supporter. But also, you know, one to give balance to the debate because that's the, you know, there's no fun in debating if everybody's in agreement with one another. You know, <laughs> then, then it's just, you know, it's just talking. You know, there's really no back and forth. Um, but I just don't know. Everyone's like, oh, well, get rid of this guy. Get rid of that guy. Trade Sanchez. Trade Hicks. Trade, trade Frazier. He was another one that's always being brought up. When it comes to the trade market, you also have to remember the trade market is a very fluctuating entity. It, it has its highs, it has its lows. With the CBA negotiations pending, the trade market, I think, is going to hit an extreme high where you're going to see tremendous players that are going to be on the move. And 
I think it could also affect what free agents do prior um, once negotiations complete. So it's really going to be a very, we already said it's going to be a, a disastrous off season for baseball, uh, especially when it comes to public relations, it's going to be a bloodbath. And the more, if the Yankees can get most of their problems fixed before the negotiations, I think that they're really going to be in a good spot going into the free agent market. That's question. With the lockout, with the lockout looming, is this the worst possible offseason in order for the Yankees to rebuild their entire roster, which they need to do? No, it's gonna if they can't make the right moves before the lockout, then the Yankees are, I think, are going to be in a world of trouble. I really do. I think they're gonna be so far behind the eight ball if they don't have they need to go in before December first. Here are the things that they need to adjust for address first. Catcher, okay. center field. Catcher and center first field. Base. First base, you can fix with the trade. But I think first base is going to be tricky because do you trade for Olsen or do you try to sign Rizzo? Either way, the Yankees can win that win that move. Yeah. Either way, it's a win. Center field but... is going center field is going to be tricky. Because right. we've seen that Cashman has been very patient with players that are injury prone. And we, we saw it with Sanchez. And to some degree, let's be honest, they've been very patient with Judge. You know, he's been he's been a staple in right field despite the fact that he's had an injury every season. So uh, Cashman's a very patient GM with his his players that he likes. So right. center field is going to be uh, – I don't think we're going to see a starting center field, a trade, you know, a trade for a starting center fielder or a signing, but we're going to get that backup type in, uh, outfielder. Wow. So, you're, so you don't think they're going to go and get a number one center fielder to replace Aaron Hicks? You think they're going to get a backup? I don't think Hicks? Cashman's ego will allow him to. I mean, well, okay, but there are rumors that were very hot on Brian Reynolds of Pittsburgh. I mean, let's all let's look at it one way. Brian Cashman only really discusses trades with uh, organizations he's comfortable with and he's close to. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, uh, as Kevin Kernan said in, in Simonetti's excellent interview, uh, he, uh, he he basically indicated that uh, Brian Cashman needs to win every trade. Right, and because of that, some GMs don't like working with Brian Cashman because of that. Cashman has to win every single trade, right? And um, that's why it's it's more focused now on on organizations such as Pittsburgh and Oakland, right at the top of my head. And there's a couple others, um, but uh, so with that in mind, Pittsburgh and the Yankees like to work together. Okay, there's a fit there. Brian Reynolds would be fantastic in the Yankees, but we also know. The Pittsburgh and ask for a ton, so well, I don't think that... we're going to trade for Reynolds and Olson. I don't think I think there's I think there's enough prospects to, to trade for one of the two. Um, which one yeah. would you take? I think you go after Olson first um, to figure out first base because I think, I think then that leaves you a little flexibility to see where you can go in the in the market with center field. Um, because you, there are, there are options internally. Um, and I'm actually going to include, because it's a border, he's a, he's a border free agent is Brett Gardner. Um, I think if the market really is getting stubborn with center field, I think that's the only way that Gardner gets a new contract, um, to be Hicks's backup again. And Gardner still has ability. The age is going, you know, as much as people are ready to move on from him and they want to see some youth, a one, another one-year deal with Gardner is not the end of the world. But I don't even they think need, they need be to entering. focus on doing better than that. Gardner needs to be a last-case scenario type. Of free, uh, well, sorry. that's exactly it. Yeah. He's the last-case scenario because yeah. he's got far bigger fish to fry. I'm sorry. We actually need a starting center fielder. 
No, and I know, can't rely on Aaron Evans. Been very, Evans has been very high on Brian Reynolds. He talked very highly of him when we were doing our shows about the trade deadline. Yeah. But the problem is teams don't want to deal with the Yankees. And I don't know if it's if Brian Cashman's ego doesn't, you know, he's a, you know, he prospects hugs is, is, is one uh, term that's Well, as, as I'm saying, he has to win every single but trade. The, that's what. Yeah, but you're not going to give up your top prospects for somebody that's not a, a top player. You want to trade your top guys for top guys. You know, oh, that's so and the Yankees I mean, get hand, the Yankees get handcuffed every time that there's in a trade. What they asked for when Cole was first on the market before he went to uh was on the on the trade block before going to Houston. Look at what Houston had to give up to what the Yankees were being asked for. The no, Yankees, that's, that's the, the, the asking price from the you know the teams asked the Yankees for an exuberant amount of talent for a player. Was Cole worth it? In the beginning, when they first announced who, you know, Pittsburgh wanted Andujar and uh, who, there, there was some, uh, Frazier. You know, they wanted guys like that that were actually being very, you know, that were contributing very well. Look at the season Andujar had at that yeah. trade deadline. You know, it's, we, we, nobody wanted to get rid of Andujar that year. We thought we had our third baseman. We knew that there were work, there were things that need to be worked out. You can't always look into the future and be like, "Oh, Cashman screwed it up." But in the moment of when the trades were being made, Cashman made the right decision, in my opinion. So, well, it's actually turned out not to be the right decision because he had to pay up three hundred and twenty-three million dollars as to 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 get him in free agency when he could have. Gone him, <laughs> just traded for him. He would have gone him at a discount. No, I think he, Cole was getting his money no matter who a team, you know, even if he was already here. Not at three hundred and twenty-three. Um, they had to bid over the odds to ensure that they get him. Um, I mean, the he obviously should have traded. I mean, listen, it's not on us to decide which prospects should be included. That's the our, that's our general manager, man. Yeah. he's the one that should be reading the. Uh, he should be the one that's scouting our prospects better than anybody else. He should know whether um, Andujar has that next level in him or whether he should be part of a, a trade piece to be for a better player because now Andujar has zero value. So, um, I mean, for instance, the best uh, example is the fact we could have gotten JT Real Muto if we were willing to give up Gary Sanchez a couple of years ago, but we weren't willing to do that. Now, we couldn't you know, get. We couldn't dream again. JT Real Muto, especially for Gary Sanchez. We can't get anybody for Gary Sanchez. So that's up to the, the our general manager to read as to what, um, you know, as to when to make these players available for trade. The, and, uh, the, he's not done it. The GM well this part of the, yeah, but the other part of the GM's job is to read the read the fans. Okay. When no, Sanchez, not. hear me out. If they, if every GM is like, okay, I got this guy in a hot streak, I'm going to move him. What's your team going to look like? You know, what what kind of caliber players are you really going to give up on? You know, if if you start worrying about the fans, you become the Mets because that's what the Mets do. They always go, oh, we're well, we need to uh, re-sign such and such in order for the fans not to be mad at us. Brian Cashman is actually pretty smart about that. I mean, he even said that in regards to Korea. I'm, I'm sorry, but. I don't think we're going to re-sign Korea. No, let's go into uh, a time. Think, let's go into a I time don't, machine. But, they were going to get. They were getting. They were getting trade proposals for Rivera because he was a failed starter. You know, and look, you know, sometimes it's this. It's very hard to gauge what moves you make and what makes you what moves you don't. No, well, just so, to finish my point, the Cashman just said the other day that he's not going to have the Yankee fans' feelings towards Korea. Uh, interrupt the way he reads the market right and he's right about that he has to see yeah. how the market translates but uh do i think we're going to sign him no i don't but um it, it, the, the yankee fan base feelings towards a certain player shouldn't change the way the yankees do business you know they have to get the best possible players um to to improve their team you know whoever it, whoever it may be so uh, i i really think that it's not really the GM's responsibility to read the fans necessarily. 
No, but that's also, you got to take it, you know, then why aren't we moving away from, why don't we trade Judge then? Get, get rid of well, him on I mean, that high. wouldn't make sense because he's one of our best players, so that wouldn't make any sense. Eh? But who knows what it he's also wouldn't make any you business don't know what he's sense do next year. Next year, he could start regressing. He could be out for well, I mean, 40 games next year. It's interesting you brought up, Aaron, Judge Bryant. Bob Clappish just released an article that the Yankees are looking into um, offering him an extension. I think they should. Yeah. I think they should too, and but it needs to be... I have been, on, I have been right one of here. those where if the Yankees were able to get the right move where they could, you know, to trade them, I think the Yankees need to be smart about it, but need to be open about it as well. But one, th- one factor and the key factor that's going to keep Aaron Judge in the Bronx is marketability. That's it. His talent will, is there. That's not a question. But Aaron Judge is a very marketable player. And that's going to keep him in the Bronx. And so I don't think any trade, I don't think his injury uh, uh, history is going to come into a factor at all. Um, although people that want to trade him because of that, you can't really argue that. You can see that point of view. Same, re- you know. So marketability um, is keeping it, is going to get Aaron Judge the extension. Of course, it wouldn't make business sense to let him go. Um, yeah. And uh, and also, he is what he should have wanted to go glove for right field, in my opinion. He just won yeah. a silver slug award for his fantastic year. So. He's one of the best players in baseball. There's no question about that. And uh, Markable, obviously, he's number one marketable player on the on the Yankee roster, so he should be re-signed. But uh, it can't be for five, six years. It needs to be probably a little bit less than that. So when you but, look at the guys on the roster at this point, right, as of today, which of these four do you think should be the, the trade trade priority? Catcher, first base, shortstop, or center field? Well, shortstop is going to be a free agent. So we, we, we can you discuss shortstop. All right. So what, what about the other three? Which is your – I think I think we're going to go – If you were a GM, proceed. what's your priority? Well, as I say, so we don't have to worry about shortstop. That's going to be a big money free agent, okay? Um, first base, um, as I say earlier – it's a, if I was to toss up between Olsen and Reynolds, who's a bigger need, we can just re-sign Rizzo for, for two, three years, and he'd be fantastic at first base. That would free up. Um, and you st- and you're still getting a player in. with arbitrary control. And that would free up going after Brian Reynolds and, and putting our prospects towards a Brian Reynolds trade. I think center field trade. Um, I think catcher is a trade too. Um and I, I think free agent would be shortstop, and I'd be happy to re-sign Rizzo first base. That would be my current priority. Um, and then starting pitcher, I'd love to bring back Tanaka on a reasonable deal, and then and then look at at uh, and maybe another starter as well. Um, but uh, I think those are my priorities at the moment. So um, just to recap, I would say. Let's go in for Brian Reynolds. I like that idea. Yeah, now, and he's a guy that we've talked about a lot on the show, um, especially when you know whenever trade talks came into play in the middle of the season. Brian Reynolds is probably mentioned in every episode. So let me um, return the same question to you, Tats. What do you think? What was your, if you're the GM? What did you do? I think catches. I think cat, the catcher needs to be addressed first. Uh, of the of the you know if uh, all right so let's break it down what I mentioned you had catcher first base shortstop center field are the four position point uh, positions when you have the uh, the right catcher behind the plate everything else starts to fall into place you know it, the the pitching is more relaxed they're more they're able to pitch their their ability because they have trust that the catcher is going to be able to do their job. So if they want to throw a curveball in the dirt to try to get a swing and miss, you know, then they're going to be more uh, acceptance to make that make that pitch. 
Can I interrupt? If that's your premise, are you saying that that needs to be a priority ahead of signing Seager, for instance? Well, no, because the shortstop and, and first base, I would rather go free agency. So if okay, I'm talking so you about wanna... positions where we go strictly by trade. Okay, so... That's what I'm saying, catcher over center field. So you want to trade for a catcher, okay. And, uh, and what about center field? I would worry about making your... a trade for center field. Would you go free agency with center field, or would you look at the... We have it so... We have so many prospects that don't have, you know, positions to, you know, or they don't have a position to fill. You can't hold on to all these guys forever and just hope. You know, look what happened with Garcia. You know, we don't know what he's going to turn out to be. You know, is Gil going to be more, more of a bullpen guy? So, you know, so there are so many question marks with, you know, and we also have to, you know, you got Dominguez. What do you do with Dominguez? You know, do you do you move away from Dominguez to get Brian Reynolds? You know, so there are so many different questions that are coming into play. The more as discussion, you know, as debates among the fan bases go on, more questions start coming up, and it's it's chaotic, and it, and it, but it's fun. It's okay. A fun but more specifically, more specifically, then, um, are you re-sign Rizzo? Or trade for Matt Olson. I would resign Rizzo. I think when it comes to first base, if you have an op, if you if you have a way, uh, the option of a top defensive first baseman that's a lefty, there's your priority. That's the one you go for. If that doesn't work, then you go okay. What's out there? But you have to be able to – I think um, Rizzo is the priority for first base. And I would go for Seager also. This way you, it's another lefty in the lineup. I think that has to be taken into account. We need those lefties in Yankee Stadium. Agreed. Um, what about the recent tweet by Jeff Passan? Um, in an unexpected turn, shortstop Corey Seager and infielder Marcus Simeon are among the players whose markets have accelerated to the point they could sign before the expected December 1st lockout, sources tell ESPN. Seager is a think? very quiet player. You, know, you don't really hear him. Um, he seems very reserved, very to himself. Um, seems more grounded and humble. Um, so I think he's going to be one of the, he doesn't want to drag it out. He wants to know where he's going to go. I can see Seager being a guy of the, uh, the free agent shortstops. Um, I think he's going to, I, I can see it being very possible that he's moved before, uh, the dock out. We could, this could happen, man. This could happen. Seager could be here. Could be a Yankee just in a couple of weeks. I hope so. I, I would prefer. I that's. Is he the the uh, the superstar headline name like Correa? No, but he's real. He's a phenomenal. He, he's still that top tier shortstop that, that's on the market. So if you're able to grab him before, you know, shit hits the fan, then you grab him and you just make sure that you get that, you know, that ink is dry before that lockout. This way he can start getting himself ready to come to the Bronx and wow everybody that didn't want him. He's the perfect fit for Yankee Stadium with him being a lefty. Yep. Um, the defensive metrics worry me. Um, it's his his metrics don't really uh, are actually a, a negative. His his defensive metrics, I believe, they're like twenty sixth among shortstops. Uh, whereas Korea is way up. You know, he's he's plus twelve and now it's above average, and and Seager's uh, a negative in that regard. So um, that is something to pay attention to because you'd obviously want a quality, you know, shortstop, fantastic shortstop in there, but. 
I think the Yankees love Seager because of his lefty bat and the power that he'll provide. And he'll be a serviceable shortstop rather than like sensational. You know what I mean? No, we, we, we've managed, you know, we were able to survive to a degree with, um, with Torres at shortstop. As much as he didn't make the, the, the plays that got them on the, you know, the highlight reels, he wasn't an abomination at shortstop. He just had those little bursts where he would have that week where it looked like he didn't know what he was doing. And then there were times that he actually, you know, he was showing up. Maybe he's starting to turn it around. And once it started to affect his um, appearances at the plate, you started to see really just everything start to crumble underneath Torres. I think Seager is more of a seasoned player and he's more comfortable at shortstop where you're not going to see a, a negative in the defense become a negative at the plate. I think he's very um, well adept to separate the two. And that's, that's really a, uh, an ability that's underrated in baseball. Mark Feinzan, the Yankees are in the market for a short, for shortstop, but believe that within the industry is that they prefer Corey Seager, whose left-handed bat would be a better fit than Correa in their lineup. That's uh, that's the general belief around baseball. Um, I mean, listen, you're not going to lose either way. Seager's a terrific player. Correa is a terrific player. Correa is a far better shortstop. But if you're looking for a fit with Yankee Stadium, and obviously the Yankees really are in balance between lefties and righties, Seager would would fix that balance. Um, you know, we're, I think this is going to be a very exciting couple of weeks. No, it, it's going to be it's, it's going to be a shit show. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be you're going to see a lot of fans from um, opposing teams. And even fan bases internally are just they get, we're going to tear each other apart. We're going to make more enemies this all season than friends, you know, as far as the fans go. Um, In what way? In what way? Well, I think Correa is the, the he, he's the, the poster child for it because you have fans, right. you know, that haven't moved on from 2017. Myself and Evan have. have you know, we're not going to get into all of that. We, we said on well, what, you, what you want. But you also, you know, you have players, that, well, you're going to start hearing about all these advanced, advanced metrics. You're going to hear about, well, he doesn't have the heart of the game. I Oh, he's coming to my team. Now he's going to my team. You know, and you're going to see all this, you know, I think it's just going to be very tense, um, especially when it's, well, if you try to look at things through the business point of view, when the negotiations start, you're going to have, you know, people that are going to be only on the fan side and that the owners are greedy. You're going to have people on the ownership side going, well, the, the, you know, the players just need to do their job and, and stop getting concerned with the business part of it. They're going to get paid. You know, if you get a $3 million to drop in your salary, are you going into the poorhouse? No. You know, so. I think that's where a lot of the battle is going to be, whether you're pro player or pro owner. That's when you're going to start to see most of the turmoil. I can see a little bit of turmoil in regards to the future of Nima Torres and Gary Sanchez, because we do know that within the Yankee fan base, there's a lot of fans of both players, especially Gary Sanchez. I think a lot of he's quite a. I, know, I might have to change player. the name of my cat. Exactly. I mean, you've listened, literally called your cat after Gary Sanchez. Yeah. Rob has got <laughs> at least one bobblehead of Gary Sanchez that we know of. Um, so, you know, obviously, that's two members of the Pinstripe Chronicles who are, are pretty hard in the San Gary Sanchez camp. I've never been a Gary Sanchez fan. I don't think Evan's necessarily much of a fan either, but... No. Um, in terms of that, which is also a microcosm of the way the fan base is, it's kind of 50 50. I think a lot of us are ready to move on from him just purely because I, I believe that he's quite a lazy player, even though his talent is un, is unquestionable. Um, 
I've always been in the belief that the catcher position needs to be defense first. And if you've got enough pop, then that's fine. That's kind of what you're looking for. But this Yankee team does not need to rely on power from the catcher position. We can get it. We've got it basically in every other position. So um, catcher should be more focused on defense. And I think that's why Higashioka, when he played, made such a nice difference. Um, now he's obviously not the bat that Sanchez is, but he's more reliable defensively. And it, it generally paid off in the games that Higashioka started. So I think that um, we should be definitely addressing the catcher position. And I think we should be moving on from Gleyber Torres too, because I want DJ LeMahieu playing second base rather yeah. than third base. I think he should be playing second. I yeah, don't well, want to play first. I, 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 Not I avoided, yet, anyway. I avoided bringing up Torres because I think that'd be more of a fun debate with the four of us. But uh, yeah, but that we'll, we'll have to get back. We're going to dive back into what what Torres. Is well, doing. the reason why I bling up Graber Torres is because <coughs> he'll probably be in trade discussions. I mean, yeah. if you're going to be looking at a Reynolds or something like that, maybe Graber Torres is on the table in that regard. You know, they're they're if we are in the Matt Olson sweepstakes, do we make Graber Torres available? Um, because yeah. we have to think about DJ LeMahieu. We did yeah. resign him to a significant contract. Um. He's going to be part of the next couple of years. Um, we could, for instance, sign Rizzo to a two-year deal plus an option. Okay, have DJ LeMahieu play second base for those two years, and then when Rizzo's deal expires, we move DJ to yep. first base. Which kind of, which follows the way his career arc will be, because as he gets older, you'd probably want him to be playing first base. So that kind of makes sense if you're looking at the timeline. So I think that. Um, I think that Torres is never going to be the 38 home run player that he was a couple of years ago. Nope. He might might sneak 20, but he's only had what nine home runs all last year. Uh, there's a there's a drop off there. It's not just because he played uh, shortstop. So um, I would consider moving him in the in the right deal for sure. No, I think a lot of it was his mentality. I, I think he yeah. just felt emotionally broken um, and just never was able to get himself right. So who knows what's going to happen with, with Torres. But before we sign off for the day, when you're, when you're in a debate, and, and this is for anybody listening, anybody watching, watching, just remember, when you're in a debate with other fans about players and whatever, just, it's just a sport. It's just a game. You know, don't, don't let it get too personal. You know, enjoy the debate. You know, don't make it into uh, – don't make it – don't let it turn into hate for somebody else. Because if we keep hating on each other, it's really it, – it doesn't make it any more fun. So just be careful uh, they, how you is, work is this the Is this the Friday afternoon wisdom of tats? Yes. Just, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with somebody. You don't have to hate them or trash them. Or Make love no them more. All over, uh, on Twitter and try to, you know – embarrass them just take their opinions for what it's worth leave your opinion debate about it in a healthy way and move on with your day it's not it's not that complicated make love no war yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> would evan really agree with this no hey, this is why i'm trying I'm, everybody on twitter I'm, I'm actually talking to evan but i <laughs> This so my, this is aimed at him when he watches. Is, right? okay. No, it's not. No, Evan. <laughs> wait, wait. Evan, if Evan's attacking you, you said something wrong first. <laughs> <laughs> but now you, that is going to wrap things up for us today. Just remember, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Check out our social medias in the description. And where you pinch strikes with pride, play hard. Good weekend, folks. <laughs>